So, welcome back to the 2018 We Don't Have Time Climate Conference. Yes, welcome. I was thinking, Martin, you're a climatologist and, and you're an expert on climate change. And uh, we just learned that the situation is pretty serious. And I feel like, should I go hide under a rock or something? That's a bad idea. <laughs> That's a bad idea. <laughs> the world idea. needs you, for instance. There is hope. And hiding under a rock is, is not going to solve any problems. It's gonna, no, no, no. But sometimes you need you to be like more it. active, actually, when yeah. we try to solve these problems. Uh, so there's hope for humanity, yeah. And in this segment, you should stay because we will focus on the way out of the climate crisis and how do we reduce the emissions, how do we change consumption, transportation and production patterns, and what kind of policies and international agreements would be most effective. And we will discuss new technology, world politics and how cooperation can create be best practices and compete through sustainability. That's going to be a challenge. Yep. Yes, it's high time to introduce our panel and keynote speakers. Uh, with us here in the studio, we, uh, studio we will have Tove Alström, climate reality leader with over 15 years experience in sustainability work. Also here in the studio, Robert Falk, CEO and founder at Einride. Anders Wikman, co-president of the Global Think Tank Club of Rome. Richard Bergfors, CEO at Max Burgers. And joining us on Zoom are Hanna Lindqvist, communications and growth manager at Trine. Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And Kathy Orlando, citizens climate lobby. You are all very welcome. Mm. And please remember to post uh, comments on social media and use the hashtag we don't have time and also make sure that you have your location set in Twitter for instance and you will turn up on the on the map here so we will find you on the on I'll the globe. I'll be able to answer your questions. And we will answer questions there. It's right. It's time to introduce our first keynote speaker in this segment. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, he's a professor of economics and director of the Earth Institute in Col at Columbia University. He's also a senior UN advisor who has been called by the New York Times probably the most important economist in the world. Professor, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me and see me? We can hear you. We can hear you. Let's see. First, and now we can see you. <laughs> You're welcome. Wonderful. Let me say what an incredibly brilliant initiative you have, and uh, really the model for a global conference. Thank I've you. thought for a long time, why don't we do this with General Assembly meetings? Why don't we do this with the uh, world parliamentarians? I think what you have is uh, astoundingly important, not only about climate change, but uh, in general, such a, a, a gorgeously presented conference so I'm, I'm really impressed and really grateful thank you and thank and, you for uh, being a part of it <laughs> well thank you uh, we we don't have time but we do have a way and i think that is really the theme we don't have time in the in the literal sense that we have filled the atmosphere with uh, enough greenhouse gases that we are just on the verge of wrecking the planet and we know now that the remaining uh, carbon budget uh, the amount of cumulative carbon dioxide that could be emitted and still stay below uh, the uh, two degree upper limit, which is not even a safe upper limit, but a dire upper limit uh, set in the Paris uh, Climate Agreement is maybe uh, 600 billion tons CO2, something like that, about 15 years at the rate of today's emissions, uh, meaning we have to move to decarbonizing the world energy system. This is the, the simple point. We have to move from a world economy dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas to a world economy based on zero carbon energy, whether wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, nuclear, bioenergy, or other kinds of energy that do not emit carbon dioxide. And we have to do this essentially by mid-century. We have to end net emissions roughly by the year 2050 if we want to have a likely chance that's technically defined as roughly a two-thirds probability, only a two-thirds probability, no certainty, but a two-thirds probability of uh, staying within the Paris upper limit. Now, this is... Fortunately, 
technically feasible because we can see the pathway to success. And the pathway to success is based on electrification using zero carbon energy. We have to produce electricity for a growing world population and a growing world economy using zero carbon sources. We have to shift from the fossil fuel dependence to electricity based on those zero carbon sources. And we have to electrify those uses of energy, especially automobiles and the heating of buildings that currently are based on say, an internal combustion engine in the case of vehicles or on a boiler or furnace in the case of buildings, to electricity. Uh, For personal mobility, that means uh, most likely battery-operated vehicles of the kind that are now burgeoning in the marketplace. For buildings, it means predominantly uh, electric heat pumps to uh, heat our buildings uh, in the winters. Uh, And, of course, it means energy efficiency to be using energy in a far more efficient way, which is also technologically feasible with clear uh, roadmaps so that we don't need so much energy still to get the services that we require. So, in a sense, this is a quite doable proposition. It's well-defined. It does require a plan of action. It does require a strategy that stretches out 25 or 30 years. Most countries can't do that. Uh, Their politics are too disorganized, too short term, too corrupted to so far have done this right. Sweden typically is doing very well in this in the sense that it has a clear uh, line of sight. Stockholm uh, is aiming to decarbonize uh, within this period. The neighboring uh, great cities of Scandinavia, Oslo, Copenhagen, each have plans of action. They're all based on the same principle, zero carbon electricity, electrification of needs, and energy efficiency. And one could add, just as a footnote, that there are particular sectors, uh, for example, shipping or large vehicles that require their own technology pathway. Perhaps instead of uh, battery uh, operated electricity, it's fuel cells. So you use renewable energy to produce hydrogen, and then you combust the hydrogen, for example, in uh, large ocean going vessels, which is already starting now. I met with a major shipper in uh, Antwerp uh, just uh, 10 days ago, who's converting his massive ocean going uh, freight Uh, carrying vessels to uh, uh, hydrogen combustion. Uh, In other words, uh, this is a a kind of electricity pathway, but with a hydrogen detour. Similarly for aviation, uh, the technology pathway could be synthetic uh, hydrocarbons where uh, renewable energy is used uh, together with carbon dioxide and catalysts to produce synthetic uh, hydrocarbons, which then become the aviation. Fuel. But suffice it to say, for our purposes, the key is decarbonized by mid century. The essence of that is a clean grid that you that uh, provides a, an increased load of electricity for electrification of current uses, plus vehicles, plus buildings, plus industrial processes. The technological pathways are rather well understood, even though there are still advances to be made, but rather predictable advances of normal R&D in better batteries, uh, better solvents, better catalysts, uh, better fuel uh, cells, and so on, but nothing extraordinarily uh, out of sight. Now, what is missing, therefore, in the solutions? I would say two big things. Uh, One are plans of action, the knowledge and capacity to look ahead, to understand that we need everywhere in the world, the United States, Canada, the Middle East, China, India, the European Union, need to decarbonize by mid-century. 
and that there is not so much choice of what to do, though there are specificities depending on whether you have wind or solar or <laughs> geothermal or hydro or others that you need to tap. And you need to tap solutions that are transnational because uh, it is these are issues that can't be solved on a national basis, just as we currently uh, transport and ship uh, coal, oil, uh, and natural gas, uh, so too we should be trading renewable energy across uh, long-distance transmission lines or, or even shipping uh, synthetic hydrocarbons and so forth. So these are transnational plans that are needed, typically regional. And in the U.S., we need to join with Canada and Mexico to have a clean grid, not to do this three countries uh, individually, still less to build a wall with Mexico, the absolutely absurd idea of my president, uh, which uh, makes uh, zero uh, sense, uh, of course. So the first thing is plans of action. The second thing is political economy. And what that means is oil drives you crazy. Oil corrupts politics. Oil buys politicians. You may have noticed that in my crazy country, the United States, uh, the one country in the world out of 193 that has declared the intention to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement, though we have a crazy president, it's not because our president is crazy that that's happening, actually. It's happening because the Republican leadership in the U.S. Congress is owned and operated by the oil industry. We have big oil that pays huge amounts of campaign contributions, utterly corrupt, though in the American genius, it's all made legal, which is weird. But the oil companies and oil men like David and Charles Koch pay the campaign contributions of our senators who then tell the president of the United States, duh, pull out of Paris, because that's what these short-sighted, nasty oil companies are after. Let me give you the list. It's Coke Industries, it's ExxonMobil, it's Chevron, it's ConocoPhillips. It's not a large number. What the hell are they thinking? Because the whole world depends on us decarbonizing, but in their greed, they are perverting the political system for a few more years of profit. Or in Canada, completely weird, you have uh, Justin Trudeau, who is a green uh, and uh, environmentally uh, friendly politician who's defending more pipelines for natural gas. Why? Because politics of the province of Alberta. So to bring it to conclusion, we have to have sound plans based on decarbonizing technologies, and we have to know the fight that we're really in. It's actually not the fight against the ignorance of the people. It's not the confusion of the people, even in the United States, despite all the propaganda. It is big oil, and it's the resistance of 20th century industries that are trying to block the 21st century. One final note, if I might, and then I'll conclude. And that is that uh, China, which has a lot of work to do in decarbonization, has put together a wonderful initiative called the Global Energy Interconnection. And they've made an organization called GEIDCO, G-E-I-D-C-O, Global Energy Interconnection Development Cooperation Organization with the idea of linking together all of the world's renewable energy into a connected grid to service all of the world for deep decarbonization. It's this kind of bold thinking, planning ahead, looking forward, deliberately investing that can bring us to safety now. There are not technological or economic barriers. We're gonna make it but we're in the final stages of the political economy battle where corrupted politicians twisted by the interests of big oil are still resisting. But it is movements like we don't have time 
that will break the hammerlock of the oil industry and enable humanity to save itself. Thanks very much for letting me be, be with you. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs. We'll be happy to have you join us for the first of the two following panel sessions later on. Uh, to ask questions to Jeffrey and the other panel members, if you haven't already, now is the time to use the hashtag we don't have time on Twitter. And now it's time for our next speaker, Anders Wikman. Anders is, among other things, co-president of the global think tank Club of Rome and a member of the International Resource Panel. And you are our next keynote speaker. Thank you. Welcome, Anders. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. And I can only agree with uh, the comments made by Professor Sachs, um, both about the need for a plan of action, but also about the need for a economic framework that is fit for purpose and as soon as possible to do away with uh, with all the money in politics but let me add a few dimensions to to this discourse um, if we look back at what we've been doing in europe for the last 20 years <clears throat> we have taken away roughly 20 percent of uh, our emissions territorially and that we've been doing within the present system um, by making it basically a bit more efficient. But to move towards zero in terms of emissions towards the middle of this century will require something totally different. Here we are talking about transformation, not only incrementalism. To cut away a few percentages here and there may be good, but in fact, it can, in some sectors, uh, lock us more in to the present system and structure. So there is a hell of a difference between really moving towards transformation and to do away with 10, 15, 20 percent as we have done in the past. Now, the only area or the only sector where we have seen some transformation is what Jeffrey Sachs referred to. We have seen wind and solar replacing power production increasingly. And that is, of course, very, very positive. But we need to step up investments in the energy field significantly, because we still depend on fossil fuels for roughly 80% of, of the energy mix in, in the world. I guess we would have to invest three to four times more yearly in renewable energy of different kinds to make what we should be doing. Uh, and IRENA, which is the international uh, organization that follows renewable energy developments, came out with a report the other day basically saying if we do this, make these investments, we will also benefit largely by reducing climate risks, but also by having cleaner air and thus also much uh, improvement of health for the populations. Much of what we have done in the energy field is going in the, di the wrong, uh, right direction. But we also need to think about how we produce goods and services, what we produce, mobility and transport, infrastructure in particular, textiles, electronics, and how we till the land, produce the food. And here, as well as in the energy field, we need transformations. And the problem is not only that in all these sectors, we need energy, and mostly today, fossil energy, to make things happen. Fossil materials are also part of the production system. Steel, for instance, in today's technology, you need coal to, to deoxidize uh, the ore and, and, and produce steel. Plastics are made from oil and gas. Textiles, increasingly, are made from polyester and thus from oil and gas. So here we have examples of products and production schemes which have to be totally revamped and rethought. And if we look at basic materials, steel, cement, plastics, aluminium, they make up more or less 20% of carbon emissions in the world. And in the International Resource Panel, which I belong to, we have made a calculation that in the next 
20 to 25 years, we will in the world, in particular in developing countries, build as much infrastructure in urban areas that we have done hitherto. And if that takes place with today's technologies and materials, we can forget about the Paris Agreement because the carbon budget will be more or less consumed by those basic materials. Look at textiles, it's another crucial area. We produce more than 100 million tons of textiles each year. Maybe 60% of those end up with consumers. The rest, most of it is being destroyed. And yet we consume a lot of land, water, energy and produce carbon emissions. Six, seven percent of carbon emissions are directly or indirectly linked to textiles. So that's another area where we need to rethink and do things in a different way. Electronics is yet another area where less than 20% of the electronic waste is now being recycled or reused, mostly copper and gold. It's an enormous problem. And ultimately, it's about design, how products are designed. If you, if you have a, an Apple computer, for instance, you cannot even change the battery. So that's just an example that those linear flows of products and materials is something we have, to, we have to rethink. Food production is another area where as soon as you put a plow in the soil, you release carbon. And you also uh, contribute to erosion. There are alternatives, but they are not really practiced widely. You can have no tilling, you can have rotational crops, you can have uh, um, uh, deep roots, uh, uh, perennial crops. Then you will um, uh, incentivize or you will enhance fertility, enhance the water retention capacity. You will reduce inputs because you need less fertilizer and, and pesticides. And you will build carbon in the soil. So that, that's another sector where we need to rethink what we are doing. And when I refer to construction and production systems, there you have, of course, a number of options. One is to move from linear material flows to circular material flows, the so-called circular economy. It's about reuse, it's about recycling, refurbishment, but it's also about longer extend product life and the sharing economy. Here are enormous opportunities, but they will require policy measures to incentivize designed for recycling, designed for reuse, and they will also ultimately depend on carbon taxes to make it less favorable to use working materials and more favorable to use secondary materials. So I can think of many, many things to do with regard to materials, uh, but unfortunately the policy process is slow. Yet another example is, of course, substitution. You can build high-rise buildings nowadays in wood inst instead of concrete and steel. That's a perfect example. You can, of course, replace um, polyester by uh, materials uh, uh, from, from, from the forest, like viscose. And then you also gain from a climate uh, uh, mitigation point of view. So I've given you a number of examples uh, and adding to the energy uh, challenge where we need to, to transform uh, our, our systems. And it will not happen by itself. Markets will not do it by themselves. We need clever policy frameworks. And ultimately, we need to put in place a system in the economy which has a better balance between man and nature, between short term and long term, between private consumption and public goods. And I think that's what, what, what uh, Jeffrey Sachs also was aiming at when he referred to the political economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anders. You're a very experienced politician and you had uh, highlighted a lot of the technological and economical uh, solutions here, but what does it actually take to change the mind of a politician? Well, that's a good question. I think one of the basic problems, and, and Jeff referred to it, yeah. is that in many parts of the world there is too much money in politics. Uh, so so that, that is one of the problems. The other one is that the political system is too short term. Mm. Here we are dealing with a lot of long term problems and challenges. And if you have to, to go to the voters every second year or every fourth year, it, it really prevents you from being long term. Yeah. Uh, it, it looks like that at least. So, so, th th so those are two very critical issues. The third one, I think, is that the economy is so short-term. Mm. 
Um, and the idea that short-term profit maximization for, for all the companies in the world mm. would be compatible with long-term sustainability on the planet, given today's policy frameworks, is ridiculous. So, so we need to look at also the financial system uh, and, and, and the way we incentivize long-term yep. thinking and, and acting in the economy. So we need to focus on, the public need to focus on that side. Thank you very much, Anders. Thank you. And uh, now uh, our next guest is uh, Tove Alström. She's... Uh, climate reality leader with over 15 years of experience working with sustainability and until recently the head of sustainability at Apotea, a Swedish online pharmacy. And Tove, you will talk about how and why phasing out microplastic is a good idea. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Tove, you have really worked hands-on to get rid of microplastics. How bad are they? Yeah, it's, it's really bad out there in the oceans. Uh, it's full of plastics. And uh, in the, s the near future, there will be more plastic than fishes in the sea. So, and what's really bothering is, is that microplastics is such a small part of plastic that fishes think that it's plankton. So they eat it as yeah. it's food. So uh, that's very, very bad. And when they enter the fish, they enter the food chain. It's easy to say food chain, but you really, m most people eat fish yeah. also, so you get into your, your own body further on. Yes. Uh, so <coughs> when do we, uh, eating fish, yeah, but yeah. when do we come in, in contact with microplastics? Yeah, uh, that was, I mean, microplastics have uh, approximately 67 different names, so they are really hard to keep track of. Mm. Uh, and what I found out when I worked at the pharmacy was that they are very commonly used in, in uh, cosmetic products. Why? Uh, yeah, they could be like uh, exfoliating for exfoliate your skin, but also for feeling nice. They have a lot of different kind of uh, areas where, why they are used. But we put them in there. We can also take them out. So, I mean, for, for normal consumers to know all these 76 different microplastics, it's even hard for me to remember them all. Yeah, and we, we spoke before and you, you learned me that mm. there are a lot of microplastics in, in a lot of lipsticks. Yes. Did not know. No. no. Uh, but so how did you manage to face them out? Because you did. Yeah, no, it was kind of easy. <laughs> we had 17,000 products. And then I asked the IT department to just give me a list of the products and then on the, uh, also the ingredient list. Yeah. And then I just searched and marked the products that contained uh, microplastics. Uh, and then I just told the purchasing department to not buy them anymore. And then the interesting work started uh, to, to communicate with the suppliers, asking them, I see that you have, I, I assume that you have microplastic here. And they were like, no, no, this is not exfoliating products. And they lied. Oh, no, this is not a microplastic. Only polyethylene is a, a microplastic. So the awareness was very low mm. uh, regarding microplastics. But what happened next after uh, you took this decision to... Yeah, no, I mean, we phased them out, 230 products uh, finally left our assortment. And after like six months, they actually started coming back oh, because yeah? the suppliers, they took the microplastic out. And that was really the, the nice part of it all. That's great. That's yeah. great. Thank you so much. We will now move on from plastics to burgers. Next speaker is Richard Bergfors. The production of beef is a major contributor to the emission of greenhouse gases. So how do you build a climate conscious burger company? To answer this question, we welcome Richard Bergfors, CEO at Swedish Max Burgers. Richard, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, Max is Europe's oldest uh, burger chain. Uh, it was started by my parents, my mother and father, uh, back in 1968, so 50 years ago, in, in the very northern part of Sweden, uh, above the Arctic Circle. And I'm the CEO of Max since 2002. And today we have approximately 6,000 employees and restaurants in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Poland, Egypt, and United Arab Emirates. 
Most of our restaurants are still uh, owned and operated by the family. And surveys show that we have the best tasting burgers in all the markets that we operate. But surveys also show that Max is seen as one of the most responsible companies. So it's not strange that we have pride. So the last 16 years, we have doubled our turnover every fourth year, and we are now rapidly expanding international. But let's have a look at Max carbon footprint. Analyze all the way from the farmer's land to the guest stand. Here comes our figures for 2016. Transport, which comes top of mind for so many people, just make out 3% of our emissions. Packaging, which is a big part of the eating experience, adds another 3%. Plant-based food is 13%. Then that includes all veggies, all beverages, all buns, and all fries. Then comes beef, some whooping 65% of our emissions. And finally, 13% other animal-based, such as bacon, chicken, egg, fish, cheese, and so on. So what do you do when, when your core product is a major climate villain and should be reduced? When Max signature product, or cash cow if you will say that, is currently incompatible with the dreams of a family company that is built to last. Well, for us, the first step was to admit that we were a part of the problem, which means that we have to be a part of the solution. And how do we become a part of the solution? Well, apart from some fairly straightforward climate initiatives like switching over to 100% wind energy since 2008. We also implemented many energy efficient programs. Uh, we switched to green company cars, green transportations. We have also done some more uncommon ones like upcycling of fry oil to diesel and soap, becoming full, fully palm oil free, and having food waste and other waste below 1%. But to the really unique ones, we are the first restaurant chain in the world to put the, food, the full food climate impact directly on the menus, so our guests have the opportunity to make informed decisions. We are the only burger chain in the world that are planting trees uh, to fully compensate for ours and our suppliers' climate emissions. Uh, so far, we have planted something like 1.4, 1.5 million trees that suck down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And that's equivalent to, to 4,000 soccer fields, or as if you took 160,000 cars off the planet for a year. But we also changed our menu. We have crea created the widest range of green burgers in the industry. And this is our most profitable product launch ever. A green burger has 50 to 80% lower climate impact than a red meat burger. And when I was a kid, I was paid in burgers when I work at the restaurants. And many, many thousand burgers later, I still love burgers. Uh, I, I even eat burgers at Christmas. And, and I would say that our whole family and our whole company is obsessed with burgers. And that burger's passion has proven to be very useful to do something really important for the climate. To make sure green burgers taste as good as normal burgers, our goal is that in just four years' time, every second sole meal at our restaurant should be made of non-red meat. And if we succeed in that, which I'm very positive that we will, we have reduced our total climate emissions by 30% in just a little bit over five years' time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Rickard, very much. Thank you so much. Please.
you can I think you can stay because we're having a panel session in a short while. We have been talking about the need for a big transformation of the world economy and local initiatives from Swedish companies. Let's try to merge these perspectives. It's time for the first panel session in the solutions segment. As before, use the hashtag we don't have time on Twitter for questions to our panel. Uh, we have via Zoom with us Jeffrey Sachs, Hanna Lindqvist, Kathy Orlando. Uh, here in the studio we have Richard Bergfors, Tove Fal uh, Robert Falk, Anders Wikman, Christopher Friberg and Tove Alström. Welcome to all of our panel members. Welcome to you guys and also hello all Zoom uh, participants. Uh, Anders. Uh, you talked earlier about our need to transform. Uh, are these examples of phasing out bad products, examples of transformation or incremental steps in your point of view? Well, I mean, there, there may... No, if you phase out bad products or you phase out carbon pollution production process, that's, that is really transformation. So we need a lot of innovation. I mean, and, and some, some interesting things are ongoing when it comes to steel to move from coal to hydrogen. It will take time, but, 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 but it's happening. Yeah. The, the problem is we have 1.6 billion tons of steel production in the world. So until all those steel production sites are being transformed, it's going to take a long, long time. A lot of steps. And I think one of the, the things we have to do in this action plan that, that Jeff was talking about is to address the losers. Because there will be many losers. There have to be many losers if this is going to happen in, in the time period required. Um, in Eastern and Central Europe, we have massive regions who are totally dependent on coal. And we can't just forget about them and, or think them away. They are there. There are lots of people depending on the jobs. So we have to, we have, to, to have a, a transformation process which, which takes that into account. Uh, and I don't see that yet, okay. unfortunately. What about all the geopolitical consequences? I mean, if we're going to reduce the amount of carb fossil carbon that we use by 5 or 10% per year, how is that going to affect the uh, producers of fossil carbon? That's going to affect them. And, you know, there will be stranded assets. Yes. I saw the other day, I don't know, Jeff, if you know about that, you probably know it much better, but the pension funds in the UK... 18% of their assets are in energy uh, companies, mostly fossil fuel-based companies. Mm -hmm. Now, if those values would just plummet, you can imagine what would happen. So, so this has to be a very balanced thing. Uh, and it, it requires holistic thinking. It requires long-term thinking. Yeah. Uh, it can be done. But with Trump in the White House, we cannot look for the initiative to come from the US in the short-term perspective. I hope that Europe, once again, can take the lead. Yeah. I have a question for you, Professor Sachs. I believe you have linked climate change to foreign politics, social unrest and even to war. Why is sustainable, uh, a, a sustainable society also a peaceful society? Well, when places become unlivable, when food is uh, uh, suffering from uh, crop failures, when people are hungry, people move uh, or they fight. And uh, we're seeing that in lots of uh, parts of the world already, especially the poor and, and dryland places of the world that are the most vulnerable to a uh, heat wave or to drought, to the loss of soil moisture. Within the Sahel of Africa, we're seeing uh, the semi-pastoral populations moving uh, towards the equator. And uh, this is uh, leading to uh, conflict. We know in Syria that while there are many reasons of that crisis, I would put U.S. imperialism very high on the list, by the way. Uh, there was also the underlying uh, instigation of a very deep uh, uh, drought uh, for several years. We're going to see a lot more of that instability if we don't head off this crisis. Uh, and I, I want to uh, commend uh, Anders for his leadership, which is uh, absolutely uh, superlative, and also for uh, bringing in uh, more holistically uh, 
at least three dimensions. We have the, the climate change, we have the loss of biodiversity and all the land use issues, and we have the massive pollution. They're all related. Uh, and actually, they move together towards the solutions. And I thought the example, if I might, uh, just on the, on the hamburgers was phenomenal and all congratulations uh, for the initiative. But I wanted to ask a question. Uh, in the United States, we have this impossible foods, uh, which is synthetic meat, uh, where uh, the, uh, the, the plants are uh, uh, engineered to produce uh, heme to taste like meat products. And I wondered whether that, uh, whether you've looked at that and whether that you think is, is a way forward actually. Yeah, I, I, I had them re um, many, many times. Um, I'm actually in, in constant contact with them. I love their products uh, and, and others as well. But, but uh, so, so I'm really uh, looking forward to, to, to convince them to, to uh, export to Europe. Uh, I think okay. though, Companies like that and, and others that are researching in, in doing uh, meat-like products, which actually taste as good or better than meat, uh, it's definitely the future for, for the planet. Mm. Martin, I think you had a question for Hanna. For Hanna, yeah, your organization is trying to do the right things in, in Africa. Um, and, but do people actually use carbon offsets and, and what can be learned from your examples from an international point of view? Well, I think it's uh, as been already spoken in, about is that we need to also uh, change the way our capital is moving. And that's one of the key uh, missions with what we try to do. We try to make sure that all these assets, so we have obviously the big funds and the really big capital in the world, but we also have plenty of capital when we look at all of us in the room uh, and on the screens and so on. And if we can move just half or a bit of that capital. I mean, preferable you want to uh, come to a future where all our uh, capital and assets are invested in sustainable ventures. Mm. And I think that's the power of uh, green finance. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you, Hannah. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Everybody didn't get to speak. It's like that sometimes. But thank you all for participating in this. It's time to move on to our next guest, uh, and that is Robert Falk. Transportation accounts for 20% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So developing fossil free transportation technology, technology is a key factor in the transition towards a sustainable economy. And here is an example of that, what that might look like. Robert Falk. Just one year ago. People could be excused for not believing it could be done. But there are no excuses anymore. Intelligent movement means zero emission, zero waste and zero traffic deaths. Not only can it be done, it's happening right now. As thousands of people join in and take their responsibility for the future. near that was like something out of star wars robert falk you are a ceo at einride are you and your company a part uh, of the solution to the climate crisis we like to think so uh i don't think that any individual can have the answer it's really going to break down to joint effort to really push for this change and at Enride, and what we stand for at the core is that we are driving that change because i personally believe is we don't, to just quote why we're here, we don't have time. I think we are stuck in the structures and we're doing too little and we're not changing quick enough. The technology is there, it's just how we use the technology and how we really use what we are and we want, we create the future that we want. Yeah, and besides uh, running on clean energy, how do you secure a low total impact uh, throughout the life cycle of your trucks? I think you shouldn't just 
think about uh, the fuel for the propulsion itself. We work together with our partner and the ambition is that we should have a whole lifespan business for the plastic that we use in, in the truck that's also more efficient from a com point of view from the climate. And also we work together with the uh, providers of the battery to really have a life cycle mm -hmm. perspective on that as well. Okay. And of course, we also need to secure that the electricity is also green. Yeah. And, and how do you think that the car and truck manufacturing, in, manufacturing industry uh, should respond to the climate crisis? I think it's actually time for us to be very harsh with them because the technology is there and has been for quite a long time. But we're stuck in structures that's really uh, a lot of people are depending on. And I think that they could have done much more at the earlier point. And I think coming from the automotive industry myself, I saw that they had no real plans just two years ago when I left. They were still thinking that towards 2045, the only alternative to propulsion would be a diesel and a fossil fuel engine. Mm. And for me, that wasn't acceptable. And I think it's going to break down to a lot of people taking that responsibility and to change their lives, to work for different purposes. And Android is funded on that purpose alone, to drive that change within the automotive industry, because we could do much more. Interesting. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you will stay with us uh, for the panel session later on. If you have any questions to Robert, use the hashtag we don't have time on Twitter. Uh, and let's move on to the next speaker, right? Mm, yeah, let's do that. I think she, she's here on Zoom. Yeah. So, Kather Orlando from Canada. You. Kathy Orlando from Canada. You are the National Director at Canada's Citizens Climate Lobby. And uh, we are ready, ready for you, your presentation. You're still mute. Um, yeah. so no, I'm not mute. Oh, okay. Now you're on your mic. I hear you. Thank you. Then yeah. Welcome. Please, go ahead. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. And I would just like to uh, be in agreement with um, uh, Jeffrey Sachs that this problem is solvable. And political stripes aside, I also agree that oil buys some politicians. And I just have a little joke for him. Um, pulling out is not an effective means of climate control. <laughs> got it. I've got it. Okay. I'm going to share my screen now. <laughs> So today I'm going to be speaking about building the political will for a livable world locally. I also work as the International Outreach Manager of Citizens Climate Lobby. And I am comforted to know all of you exist because I made a promise to my daughter when she was born in 2007, I was going to do whatever I could to make sure her world would be livable when she was 40 years old. So we have a problem. As we know, we don't have time, yet populist and anti-climate action are undermining the work that must be done. And one solution is to build political will for national and international climate action locally. I work with Citizens Climate Lobby and have been doing so since 2010. And what we do is create the political will for a livable planet and we empower people to claim their political and personal power. Citizens Climate Lobby was founded in 2007 by Marshall Saunders. And thinking I was American, he recruited me to Citizens Climate Lobby. And Citizens Climate Lobby International was born. Uh, you'll be delighted to know that Sweden was the third country to join and Australia soon thereafter. Uh, my colleague Joseph Robertson took on the role of Global Strategy Director in 2015, and we have expanded onto all the continents except for Antarctica. Uh, actually, this slide here is not correct. We now have 489 chapters, and I believe it'll be 490 on Monday morning because I just trained a group in Matari, Zimbabwe on Friday. There's about 90,000 of us worldwide. 
we have one rule and one rule only, and that is to treat politicians with admiration and respect. This is a group of us with the leader of uh, the deputy leader of the opposition party, which in Canada, which is the Conservative Party, and it, it was an amazing meeting. We had a really good conversation. That's Lisa, uh, the Honorable Lisa Wright. So our premises are that politicians do not create political will, they respond to it. All politics is local. Please ponder this formula, education plus the best ideas equals effective climate legislation. Take out education, what do you have? A lot of the problems. Um, so to cr so because politics is, is uh, 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 local, to create coordinated national global action, some of us in the climate movement need to build political will locally. Uh, James Hansen uh, is one of the advisors on our board, and he says very nice things about us. So our formula is we're very organized. Many of our countries, uh, they, they focus on carbon, fall and de carbon fee and dividend as the poly a policy solution. We have a monthly schedule, very predictable. Uh, we're not guessing at what we do. We have a master plan. We understand our commander's intent. And we focus on pulling on the five levers of political will locally. We are so organized that we have time to savor the planet as well. So our, our five levers of political will are direct lobbying. We meet face to face with our politicians. We work with our local media, newspapers, radio and TV, as well as social media locally. We do grassroots outreach and are bringing education and outreach to our local communities. We also speak with community leaders and we grow our chapters. Just briefly, this is the policy that many of the countries do lobby for. It's called carbon fee and dividend. It's a fee on carbon paste fuels at the point of entry. The fee increases steadily each year. All fees are returned to households, making it revenue neutral and low and income middle households will come out ahead or break even and it sends a clear market signal. I know these are busy slides but I'm trusting people will go back and freeze them and look at them more closely. A case study between 2010 and 2015 we grew our organization to 80 cover over 80 ridings in Canada and we have 350 or so and we went from a government that didn't do much on climate change to one that now currently is with a few problems. And two days after election, a Canadian senator sent us the following message. You have done so much groundwork that can really start to pay off. I feel the prospects for climate action are exceptional. Yes, Canada has a lot of work to do, but we are moving forward. So we support leaders who build the political will locally uh, for a livable planet. We look at the Climate movement as a giant ecosystem, the more niches we have, the more diversity we have, the stronger the global climate movement system will be. And I am grateful for all your work and for this conference. And that's my daughter with the founder and president and his wife of Citizens Climate Lobby, Marshall Saunders and Pam Saunders. And if you want to get a hold of me, here's my contact information. Thank all right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you Eith so Orlando. much. Let's move on to our next speaker, who is Christopher Friberg. Here with us to talk about how geothermal energy can transform the fossil industry into renewable is Christopher Friberg, Vice President at Energeotech. Welk welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the inviting stage me. is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very thrilled to be here today and to address today's topics. We don't have time. Uh, I have actually a very positive news today, uh, but I need your engagement. Uh, I'm here as a representative of a research and development project and we can now present a new solution how to more effectively address the global sustainability transition. 
let's look first at the current situation. We all know that fossil fuel is the problem. It's 80% of the global energy use. Uh, renewable is growing very much, but uh, still uh, at, a, at a level where it needs to be stronger. And a, a consequence of our use of fossil fuel is also that, as among others here in Sweden, we are incinerating enormous amounts of trash. Trash that is both wet trash that takes a lot of energy to take out the humidity, but also it's 50% fossil fuel based. It's plastics basically. So we haven't solved any problem by that. We are burning it just in the form of plastic uh, compared to oil and coal. Uh, so we need uh, a more efficient solution uh, to uh, complement with today's renewable energy. We all read every day in media that there is very positive growth and development in solar and wind. And some countries like Sweden has also very much hydropower. But we need a stronger portfolio of renewable energy. And what is mostly lacking today is renewable baseload energy energy. Energy that can be produced and delivered 24-7 regardless of season and time of the day. So as we need to change, we can now uh, address a new solution. Mother Earth is again uh, the solution to the challenge. And the fact uh, you have heard about earlier, I'm sure, is geothermal energy. The Earth is very, very hot. Think of it as a burning planet. Actually, in the center of the core of the Earth, it's 6,000 degrees Celsius. And 99% of the entire mass of the Earth is warmer than 1,000 degrees. So we are sitting on an extremely hot planet. This has been known and used in a few locations until today. Among other, the best case is Iceland. They changed their entire energy system in the last 20, 25 years from 100% fossil and coal to today 100% renewable, coming from geothermal heat and hydropower. And believe me, Iceland has has more energy today than they have use for. So they are thinking of all kinds of ideas to export their renewable energy. Uh, the company I am representing, uh, Energiotech, we have developed the next generation of, of geothermal energy. And it means basically that we can do the same like on Iceland, but based on much lower temperatures. We can deliver electricity, heating and cooling to all the cities and all the industries of the world. You can imagine very space efficient, completely clean, renewable baseload energy facilities uh, in your city or in your industry. We are a young company, we're a small team, we have a technology, we have an offer that we address to the big energy players out there in the world. But now we need your help. We need your help to engage in these issues. More and more companies and structures are teaming up. They realize that this is the fourth leg on the chair, but we need you and your engagement. So that's why I encourage you study the subject and you can find more information of course on our website and on the website of climate reality and we don't have time thank you very much for your attention thank you Christopher thank you Friberg. thank you so much that's great and uh, before we move on to our uh, new next uh, roundtable session i would like to introduce one last speaker you already heard her brief heard her briefly in the segment solution joining us from kenya is hanna lindqvist can you all hear me hey hanna you have Hi. a long experience Hi. in grassroots campaigning, building organizations and brand development. And you also, uh, you're also the communication and growth manager at Trine, an investment platform that enables private individuals to invest in off-grid solar energy. Triple impact, people, planet, profit is at the heart of everything that Trine does. Hannah, thanks for joining us. Thanks, it's a pleasure to join you all here. Yeah. Uh, let me share my screen. So uh, why are we here? I think for me, one of the key issues, if we're going to come to a world where we have a green future and a planet that is still around, is that we also need to think about 
what drives the sustainable future forward. Um, I think one key aspect in that is finance, and that's what I'm going to talk uh, about today, is how we can all be a part of uh, creating a sustainable future. Uh, so who is trying? Well, we're a startup with this very small vision of achieving a world where all people have access to clean energy and change the way that we invest our money. And why would we want to achieve that? Well, there's millions of people currently lacking access to basic electricity. And instead, they rely on fossil fuels, such as kerosene, uh, diesel, and so on. And this is something that you might not think about if you live, for example, like me. Most of the time I live in, in, in Sweden uh, or any other part of the world where you take it for granted. But this affects uh, almost every aspect of people's lives uh, that do not have access to this basic service. We talk about health in terms of the toxic fumes that comes out of these uh, kerosene lamps that you see on the presentation. Uh, we talk about cost in terms of that the proportion of their income that they spend on energy or uh, issues related to energy is enormous. Um, and also educational aspects that uh, when the sun goes down, for example, here in Kenya, it's pitch dark outside, meaning that a lot of children do not have the possibility to actually study uh, after the, the sun has gone down. And of course, we talk about the climate. To look at this enormous opportunity if over this one billion people who lack access to electricity, if they could go skip the fossil fuel and go directly to solar, that's a massive leapfrogging we could do right there. So, so what is then the problem in this? Well, why don't more people have access to clean energy when we actually know that it's better? it's uh, more affordable, and it helps the, the climate. Well, some of you might have guessed, uh, money. It's all about the money. There's plenty of solar companies, many of them who I met here in Kenya, for example, that wants nothing more than to provide these households with clean, affordable energy. But the problem is that a lot of these households live uh, what you call off-grid, meaning very far away from the traditional services. And the way they would pay for the energy would be through micro installments, meaning that for the solar companies to be able to cater to this need, it requires a lot of upfront capital, it requires investment, and it requires time. Uh, and for them to be able to make more impact, they also need to scale their business. So, that's where Trine comes into the picture. What we do is that we connect private individuals like you behind the screens and me uh, with these solar energy companies to provide affordable finance to them so they can scale up their business and continue to provide uh, thousands of people with clean energy. Because it's actually quite simple when you look at it. Uh, the problem in the world is not necessarily lack of capital. We know there's plenty of capital being invested into the stock market, into savings account, into the pension funds, and so on. But a lot of this capital is not necessarily doing that, that uh, good, uh, or any good, to be honest, for us or the planet. And imagine if all of this money that was invested in the traditional ventures or in uh, sectors that is currently uh, emitting carbon. Um, imagine if this was actually uh, invested into sustainable ventures. Uh, if, you, uh, if your and my money actually worked for a greener future. Uh, and that's the whole reason why I joined Trine and, and why the company was founded a couple of years ago. It was to enable all of us to be able to invest in an easy way into something that has a triple impact, that will provide and change the lives of millions of people, while at the same time reduce our carbon emissions and make sure that we actually have a planet to live on in the coming years. And 
also a very important aspect of this is the, econo uh, the uh, economical uh, development where emerging markets will be able to build a local economy that can grow and you as an investor also have a potential return on your investment. And I think that's for me why you need to think about the triple bottom line. You need to think about why uh, it's important that doing good and, and living sustainable also needs to be economical viable because that's the way that we can ensure that we have a long-term sustainability, not just in a project form or not just something that's going to uh, end in a couple of years, but actually for the long term. Uh, and that's mm. when real change can happen. Thank uh, you. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> you, you are no, but maybe I, I run out of time here. <laughs> I just wanted to quickly show how the real uh, impact. This is the heroes on the ground. Yeah. So what do we see here, Hanna? So here we see how a typical solar home system for a household in, uh, this is taken outside of uh, Kisumu in, in Western Kenya. Um, and this looks very simple. It is very simple, but it uh, continues to change lives uh, every day. Yeah. Okay. That's Thank great. you so That's much, Hanna Thank you. Lind. Kvist from Trine. We are proud to say that Trine is also our sponsor of the conference. This climate conference, carbon foot, uh, this climate conference carbon footprint from hosting, energy consumption, transports, and so on, will be calculated by Trine, and the offset will be done through investments in Trine's solar energy plants. Now let's move on to the final round table session. Mm. So we will have um, a panel session <coughs> uh, with uh, Robert Falk, Christopher Friberg and Tove Alström. And with us from Kenya is still Hanna Lindqvist. And also I think Kathy Orlando. Kathy Orlando is also here from Canada, of course, yes. And let's start with Kathy. And welcome, we should say, to all Thank of you here in the studio. <laughs> and Thank you for having us. The rest of you at the, over the globe. Um, Kathy, I have a question for you when you talk about the, the pricing of carbon. How, how will that bring uh, down the, the, or how will that change the, how much can you price the carbon in order to make it a carbon neutral? I don't like that word really, but uh, uh, to get rid of the foss fossil carbon. Well, I think the most important thing to think about when pricing carbon is we need to start off at a, at a low rate, but go up incrementally and predictably over time. So that gives economic systems the time to adjust. But we need to start now. Actually, we should have probably started when you started, Sweden, but any time is a good time. So um, the, the, we like to say 100 to $150 a ton by 2030, but starting now at yeah. $10 a ton. But then in Sweden, we have a carbon tax on the consumer side. But what you say, what you say, carbon fee and dividend, it's actually on the other side. It's on the uh, near, closer to the source. Yes, yes. So everybody um, in your yeah. country um, will, including all industries, will pay a, a carbon price. Right. Uh, really important to have border carbon adjustments uh, to keep your industry competitive, though. Mm-hmm. But are they, uh, can they sort of, can you combine these taxes from, from either side or should, do we need to get rid of our taxes and implement the other one, carbon fee and dividend? I think every country is going to have to make their own choices. Um, uh, you can stack the prices, you can phase out one and phase in another. I, I think those are going to be individual choices that countries will need to, to, to determine based on their own needs. Mm. All right. Do you guys have any uh, comments on this? Um, We're pretty no, used no. to the carbon tax in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a, it's, it doesn't harm it the, that much. But what do you think about the differences between a carbon tax on the producer side and let the market mechanisms sort of uh, pay, for it. <laughs> pay for it or move it down to the consumers and then uh, give the consumers and those with low income and low carbon uh, impact on the world, they will actually benefit from them. And those people who use a lot of fossil carbon, they will pay the bill. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's a very smart solution. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's, uh, I mean, it's just like, I think the best approach is always to sort of say, find new solution, let the market play it out and create the right incentives to how the system should be created and what the solutions we want to see in the future. Right, right. Exactly. We also need to have a kind of a, a whip and carrot system. Uh, that means also giving bonuses for good actions. Mm. Um, there are lots of people out there who are willing and eager to do something. They don't know how to do and they don't know the right timing. But the society can give them incentives to start already now. Take uh, the EV car as an example. Many people are waiting to buy an EV car. They should do it right now instead of considering considering another fossil fuel car. But will that actually move us out of the system to, as we heard Jeffrey Sachs, for instance, before, and other speakers, uh, we need, and uh, Anders Wiekman as well, we need to sort of leapfrog out of the system into something else, just not move incremental, because that ain't enough. Exactly. I think we need many measures. There is no single quick fix here. We need a lot of efforts from the society, from the lawmakers, the policymakers, and from the industry mm. uh, jointly together. Uh, th there's many efforts needed. Yeah. You had, you had a comment on that? No, no I think, I mean, the, uh, to have the, the polluters pay the price is always a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Instead of subsidiaries to, to like flying. That's... Not a, not a good idea. Right, right. Thank you so much. We don't have much time. <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> we don't, we don't have time. Literally, <laughs> we don't have time. But thank you so much. And thank you also, Hannah and Kathy. We're uh, about to wrap this segment up. Uh, and we will soon have a short... Uh, short uh, break. Uh, a big big thank you to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Anders Wikman, Hannah Lindqvist, Richard Bergfors, Robert Fall, Kathy Orlando, Christopher Friberg and Tove Alström for insights, discussions and of course solutions. Solutions. And, and what are your conclusions and your takeaways from this? It feels better now. <laughs> you feel better now, okay. Yeah, because uh, one and a half hour later from yeah. the catastrophes and you already feel yeah, better. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to the segment that we are uh, calling the action segment. Right on. That's right? great. Okay. So there is, uh, there are solutions. There is hope if we work together. And how are we going to do that? Mm. Um, I wouldn't say we're about to solve the climate climate crisis, but we because we need to do so much more than we uh, actually are doing and what we have talked about. But we're moving in the right di direction, I think. And uh, we need some action. And uh, uh, as a coincidence, no, but <laughs> that's the name of the new segment. It's called Action. And after a short break, we will be back with the third and last segment, uh, Action for a Global Climate Movement. And it starts at 6 o'clock Central European time. And that is 21.30 in India, 6 a.m. in Hawaii. and I have seven to correct you. In about in 10, 10 minutes. minutes. We'll oh, yeah, back. we're already so there. So we have to have a shorter break. Not yeah. only two minutes, but 10 minutes. 10 minutes. See you in eight 10 minutes. Eight minutes past. All right. Bye. Thank you for now.